Chapter 3 Chains, Chains Our eager hopes, our leaping expectations were soon crushed. The wind of change was blowing only in drafty corridors in the transit prisons. Here, behind the tall fences of the special camps, its breath did not reach us. And although there were only political prisoners in these camps, no mutinous leaflets hung on posts. They said that at Minlag the blacksmiths refused to forge bars for hut windows, all glory to those as yet nameless heroes. They were real people. They were put in the camp jail, and the bars for Minlag were forged at Kotlas. No one supported the smiths. The special camps began with that uncomplaining, indeed eager, submission to which prisoners had been trained by three generations of corrective labor camps. Prisoners brought in from the polar north had no cause to be grateful for the Kazakh sunshine. At Novorodnoye station, they jumped down from the red box cars onto ground no less red. This was the famous Jez Kazgan copper, and the lungs of those who mined it never held out more than four months. There and then, the warders joyfully demonstrated their new weapon on the first prisoners to step out of line. Handcuffs, which had not been used in the corrective labor camps, gleaming nickel handcuffs, which went into mass production in the Soviet Union to mark the 30th anniversary of the October Revolution. Somewhere there was a factory in which workers with graying moustaches, the model proletarians of Soviet literature, were making them, unless we suppose that Stalin and Beria did it themselves. These handcuffs were remarkable in that they could be clamped on very tight. Serrated metal plates were let into them so that when a camp guard banged a man's handcuff wrists against his knee, more of the teeth would slip into the lock, causing the prisoner greater pain. In this way, the handcuffs became an instrument of torture instead of a mere device to inhibit activity. They crushed the wrists, causing constant acute pain, and prisoners were kept like that for hours, always with their hands behind their backs, palms outwards. The warders also perfected the practice of trapping four fingers in the handcuffs, which caused acute pain in the finger joints. In Berlag, the handcuffs were used religiously for every trifle, even for failure to take off your cap to a warder. They put on the handcuffs, hands behind the back, and stood you by the guardhouse. The hands became swollen and numb, and grown men wept. I won't do it again, sir. Please take the cuffs off. Wondrous were the ways of Berlag. Not only did prisoners enter the mess hall on command, they lined up at the tables on command, sat down on command, lowered their spoons into the gruel on command, rose and left the room on command. It was easy enough for someone to scribble the order, establish special camps, submit draft regulations by such and such a date, but somewhere hard-working penologists and psychologists and connoisseurs of camp life had to think out the details. How could screws already galling be made yet tighter? How could burdens already back-breaking be made yet heavier? How could the lives of gulags, denizens, already far from easy, be made harder yet? Transferred from corrective labor camps to special camps, these animals must be aware at once of their strictness and harshness. But obviously someone must first devise a detailed program. Naturally, the security measures were strengthened. In all special camps, the perimeter was reinforced. Additional strands of barbed wire were strung up, and coils of barbed wire were scattered about the camp's fringe area. On the path by which prisoners went to work, machine guns were set up in readiness at all main crossroads and turnings, and gunners crouched behind them. Every camp division had its stone jailhouse, its disciplinary barracks, B.U.R., I shall continue to call it by this name, which prisoners remembered from the corrective labor camps and went on using out of habit, although it is not quite accurate in this context. It was the camp jail, neither more nor less. Anyone put in the disciplinary barracks invariably had his padded jacket taken from him. Torture by cold was an important feature of the BUR. But every hut was just as much a jail, since all windows were barred and latrine buckets were brought in for the night so that all doors could be locked. Moreover, there were one or two disciplinary barracks in each camp area with intensified security, each a separate camplet within the camp. These were locked as soon as the prisoners got in from work, on the model of the earlier Katorga. They were BURs, really, but we called them Rejimki. Then again, they quite blatantly borrowed from the Nazis, a practice which had proved valuable to them, 
the substitution of a number for the prisoner's name, his I, his human individuality, so that the difference between one man and another was a digit more or less in an otherwise identical row of figures. This measure, too, could be a great hardship, provided it was implemented consistently and fully. This they tried to do. Every new recruit, when he played the piano in the special section, that is, had his fingerprints taken, as was the practice in ordinary prisons, but not in corrective labor camps, had to hang around his neck a board suspended from a rope. His number, SHCH262, will do as an example, was set up on the board. In Ozer lag, by now, there were even numbers beginning with Y-E-R-Y. The alphabet was too short. And in this guise, he had his picture taken by the special section's photographer. All those photographs are still preserved somewhere. One of these days we shall see them. They took the board from around the prisoner's neck, he wasn't a dog after all, and gave him instead four, or in some camps three, white patches measuring eight centimeters by fifteen. These he had to sew onto his clothes, usually on the back, the breast, above the peak of his cap, and on one leg or arm. But the regulations varied slightly from camp to camp. Quilted clothing was deliberately damaged in stipulated places before the patches were sewn on. In the camp workshops, a separate team of tailors was detailed to damage new clothing. Squares of fabric were cut out to expose the wadding underneath. This was done so that prisoners trying to escape could not unpick their number patches and pass as free workmen. In some other camps, it was simpler still. The number was burned into the garments with bleaching fluid. Warders were ordered to address prisoners by their numbers only and to ignore and forget their names. It would have been pretty unpleasant if they had kept it up, but they couldn't. Russians aren't Germans. Even in the first year, warders occasionally slipped up and called people by their names, and as time went by, they did it more often. To make things easier for the warders, a plywood shingle was nailed onto each bunk at every level with the occupant's number on it. Thus the warder could call out the sleeper's number even when he could not see it on his garments. And if a man was missing, the warder would know at once who was breaking the rules. Another useful field of activity opened up for warders. They could quietly turn the key in the lock and tiptoe into the hut before getting up time to take the numbers of those who had risen too soon. Or they could burst into the hut exactly on time and take the numbers of those who were not yet up. In both cases, you could be summarily awarded a spell in the hole, but in the special camp it was usually thought better to demand a written explanation, although pens and inks were forbidden and no paper was supplied. This tedious, long-winded, offensive procedure was rather a clever invention, especially as the camp administration had plenty of salaried idlers with leisure to scrutinize the explanations. Instead of simply punishing you out of hand, they required you to explain in writing why your bed was untidy, why the number plate at your bunk was askew, and why you had done nothing about it, why a number patch on your jacket was soiled, and why you had not put that right, why a cigarette had been found on you in the hut, why you had not taken your cap off to a warder. Doroshevich was surprised to find prisoners taking their caps off to the prison governors on Sakhalin, but we had to uncover whenever we met an ordinary warder. Questions so profound that writing answers to them was even more of a torment to the literate than to the illiterate. But refusal to write meant that your punishment would be more severe. The note was written with the neatness and precision which respect for the disciplinary staff demanded, delivered to the warder in charge of the hut, then examined by the assistant disciplinary officer or the disciplinary officer who in turn wrote on it his decisions about punishment. In work roles, too, it was the rule to write numbers before names. Why before, and not instead of names? They were afraid to give up names altogether. However you look at it, a name is a reliable handle, a man is pegged to his name forever, whereas a number is blown away at a puff. If only the numbers were branded or picked out on the man himself, that would be something. But they never got around to it. Though they might easily have done so, they came close enough. The oppressive number system tended to break down for yet another reason, because we were not in solitary confinement, because we heard each other's voices and not just those of the warders. The prisoners themselves not only did not use each other's numbers, they did not even notice them. 
How, you may wonder, could anyone fail to notice those glaring white patches on a black background? When a lot of us were assembled, on work line-up or for inspection, the bewildering array of figures gave you spots before your eyes. It was like staring at a logarithm table, but only while it was new to you. So little did you notice them that you did not even know the numbers of your closest friends and teammates. Your own was the only one you remembered. Some dandified trustees carefully saw to it that their numbers were neatly, even jauntily, sewn on, with the edges tucked in with minute stitching, to make them really pretty. Lackeys born bred, my friends and I, on the contrary, took care that our numbers should look as ugly as possible. The special camp regime assumed a total lack of publicity, assumed that no one would ever complain, no one would ever be released, no one would ever break out. Neither Auschwitz nor Katyn had taught our bosses anything. And so the first special camps were special camps with truncheons. It was, as a rule, not the warders who carried them. They had the handcuffs. But trusted prisoners, hut orderlies and foremen. They, however, could beat us to their heart's content with the full approval of authority. At Jez Kazgan, before work line-up, the workers' signers stood by the doors of the huts with clubs and shouted, Out you come, and no last man! The reader will have understood that if there should be a last man, it was immediately as though he had never been. In Spask in 1949, something snapped. The four men were called to the staff hut, ordered to put away their clubs, and advised to do without them in future. For the same reason, the authorities were not greatly upset if, for instance, a winter transport from Karbas to Spask, 200 men, pros on the way, if all the wards and corridors of the medical section were packed with the survivors rotting alive with a sickening stench, and Dr. Kolesnikov amputated dozens of arms, legs, and noses. This Dr. Kolesnikov was one of the experts who had shortly before signed the mendacious findings of the Katyn Commission, to the effect that it was not we who had murdered the Polish officers. For this, a just providence had put him in this camp. But why did the powers of this world want him there, so that he would not talk too much? Othello's occupations gone. The wall of silence was so reliable that the celebrated disciplinary officer at Spask, Captain Vorobyov, and his underlings first punished an imprisoned Hungarian ballerina by putting her in the black hole, then handcuffed her, then, while she was handcuffed, raped her. The disciplinary regime envisaged patient attention to every detail. Thus, prisoners were not allowed to keep photographs, either of themselves, which might help escapers, or of their relatives. Should any be found, they were confiscated and destroyed. A barracks representative in the woman's division at Spask, an elderly schoolteacher, put a small picture of Tchaikovsky on a table. The warder removed it and gave her three days in the black hole. But it's a picture of Tchaikovsky. I don't care whose picture it is. In this camp, women aren't allowed to have pictures of men. In Kengir, prisoners were allowed to receive meal in their food parcels. Why not? But there was a rigorous prohibition against boiling it, and if a prisoner managed to make a fire between a couple of bricks, the warder would kick over the pot and make the culprit smother the flames with his hands. Later on, it is true, they built a little shed for cooking, but two months later the stove was demolished and the place was used to accommodate some pigs belonging to the officers and security officer Belyaev's horse. While they were introducing various disciplinary novelties, our masters did not forget what was best in the practice of the corrective labor camps. In Odzelag, Captain Mishin, head of a camp division, tied recalcitrants behind a sleigh and towed them to work. By and large, the regime proved so satisfactory that prisoners from the former political camps, Katorga, were now kept in the special camps on the same footing as the rest and in the same quarters, distinguished only by the serial letters on their number patches. Though, if there was a shortage of huts, as at Svask, it was they who would be put to live in barns and stables. So that the special camp, though not officially called Katorga, was its legitimate successor and merged with it. For a prison regime to have a satisfactory effect on the prisoners, it must be grounded also on sound rules about work and diet. The work chosen for the special camps was always the hardest in the locality. 
as Chekhov has truly remarked. The established view of society, and with some qualifications of literature, is that no harder and more degrading form of hard labor can be found than that in the mines. If in Nekrasov's Russian women the hero's job had been to catch fish for the jail or to fell trees, many readers would have felt unsatisfied. Why speak so disparagingly of tree-felling, Anton Pavlovich? Lumbering is not so bad. It will do the trick. The first divisions of Steplag, those it began with, were all engaged in copper mining. The first and second divisions at Rudnik, the third at Kengir, and the fourth at Jezkazgan. They drilled dry, and the dust from the waste rock quickly brought on silicosis and tuberculosis. Under a law of 1886, no form of work which might be injurious to health was permitted, even if it was the prisoner's own choice. Sick prisoners were sent to die in the celebrated Spask camp near Karaganda, the all-union convalescent home of the special camps. Spask deserves a special mention here. It was to Spask that they sent terminal cases for whom other camps could no longer find any use. But what a surprise! No sooner did the sick cross the salubrious boundary lines of Spask than they turned into able-bodied workers. For Colonel Chechev, commandant of the whole Steplag complex, the Spask camp division was one of his special favorites. The thick-set thug would fly in from Karaganda, have his boots cleaned in the guardhouse, and walk through the camp trying to spot prisoners not working. He liked to say, I've only got one invalid in the whole Spask camp. He's short of both legs, and even he's on light duties. He runs errands. All one-legged men were employed on sedentary work, breaking stones for road servicing or grading firewood. Neither crutches nor even a missing arm was any obstacle to work in Spask. One of Chechev's ideas, putting four one-armed men to carry a stretcher, two of them left-armed, two of them right-armed. An idea thought up for Chechev, driving the machines in the engineering shop by hand when there was no electric power. Something Chechev liked. Having his own professor, so he allowed the biophysicist Chezhevsky to set up a laboratory at Spask with empty benches. But when Chezhevsky, using worthless waste materials, devised an anti-silicosis mask for the Jezkaz gun workers, Chechev would not put it into production. They've always worked without masks. Why complicate things? After all, there must be a regular turnover to make room for the new intake. At the end of 1948, there were about 15,000 prisoners, male and female, in Spask. It was a huge camp area. The posts of the boundary fence went uphill in some places, and the corner watch towers were out of sight of each other. The work of self-segregation gradually proceeded. The prisoners built inner walls to separate women, workers, complete invalids. This would hinder communications within the camp and make things easier for the bosses. Six thousand men building a dike had to walk twelve kilometers to work. Since they were sick men, it took them more than two hours each way. To this must be added an eleven-hour working day. It was rare for anyone to last two months on that job. The job next in importance was in the stone quarries, which were inside the camp itself, both in the men's and in the women's section. The island had its own minerals. In the men's section, the quarry was on a hillside. The stone was blasted loose with amyl after the day's work was over, and next day the sick men broke the lumps up with hammers. In the women's zone, they didn't use amyl. Instead, the women dug down to the rock layers with picks, then smashed the stone with sledgehammers. The hammerheads, of course, came away from the handles, and new ones sometimes broke. To replace a head, a hammer had to be sent to a different camp zone. Nonetheless, every woman had an output norm of 0.9 cubic meters a day, and since they could not meet it, there was a long period during which they were put on short rations, 400 grams, until the men taught them to pinch stone from old piles before the daily accounting. Remember that all this work was done not only by sick people, not only without any mechanical aids at all, but in the harsh winter of the steppes. At temperatures as low as 30 to 35 degrees below freezing, and with a wind blowing, and what is more, in summer clothing, 
since there was no provision for the issue of warm clothing to non-workers, that is, to the unfit. P. Blank R. recalled how she wielded a huge hammer, practically naked, in frosts as severe as this. The value of this work to the fatherland becomes very clear when we add that for some reason the stone from the women's quarry proved unsuitable as building material, and on a certain day a certain high official gave instructions that the women should dump all the stone they had quarried in a year back where it came from, cover it with soil, and lay out a park. They never, of course, got quite that far. In the men's zone, the stone was good. The procedure for delivering it to the construction site was as follows. After inspection, the whole workforce, around 8,000 men, all those who were alive on that particular day, was marched up the hill, and no one was allowed down again unless he was carrying stone. On holidays, patients took their constitutional twice daily, morning and evening. Then came such jobs as self-enclosure, building quarters for the camp administration and the guards, dwelling houses, a club, a bathhouse, a school, and work in the fields and gardens. The produce from these gardens also went to the free personnel, while the prisoners got only beet tops. This stuff was brought in by the truckload and dumped near the kitchens, where it rotted until the cooks pitchforked it into their cauldrons. A bit like feeding cattle, would you say? The eternal broth was made from these beet tops with the daily addition of one ladle full of mush. Here is a horticultural idyll from Spask. About 150 prisoners made a concerted rush at one of the garden plots, lay on the ground, and gnawed vegetables pulled from the beds. The guards swarmed around, beating them with sticks, but they just lay there, munching. Non-working invalids were given 550 grams of bread, working invalids 650. Medicines were as yet unknown in Spask. Where would you find enough for a mob like that? And they were there to peg out anyway. And so were proper beds. In some huts, bunks were moved up together and four men instead of two squeezed onto a double bed platform. Oh yes, there is one job I haven't yet mentioned. Every day, 110 to 120 men went out to dig graves. Two Studebakers carried the corpses in slatted boxes, with their legs and arms sticking out. Even in the halcyon summer months of 1949, 60 or 70 people died every day, and in winter it was 100. The Estonians who worked in the morgue kept the count. In other special camps, mortality was not so high. Prisoners were better fed, but their work was harder too, since they were not unfit. The reader can make the necessary adjustment himself. All this was in 1949, the year 1949, the 32nd year after the October Revolution, four years after the war, with its harsh imperatives, had ended, three years after the conclusion of the Nuremberg Trials, where mankind at large had learned about the horrors of the Nazi camps and said with a sigh of relief, It can never happen again. Add to all this that on transfer to a special camp, your links with the outside world, with the wife who waited for you and for your letters, with the children for whom you were becoming a mythical figure, were as good as severed. Two letters a year, but even these were not posted after you had put into them thoughts saved up for months who would venture to check the work of the women's censors on the MGB staff. They often made their task lighter by burning some of the letters they were supposed to censor. If your letter did not get through, the post office could always be blamed. In Spask, some prisoners were once called in to repair a stove in the censor's office, and they found there hundreds of unposted letters, which the censors had forgotten to burn. Conditions in the special camps were such that the stove menders were afraid to tell their friends the state security boys might make short work of them. These women censors in the Ministry of State Security who burned the souls of prisoners to save themselves a little trouble, were they any more humane than the SS women who collected the skin and hair of murdered people? As for family visits, they were unthinkable. The address of every special camp was classified and no outsider was allowed to go there. Let us also add that the Hemingway-esque question, to have or to have not, hardly arose in the special camps, since it had been firmly resolved from the day of their creation in favour of not having. 
not having money and receiving no wages. In corrective labor camps, it was still possible to earn a pittance, but here not a single kopeck. Not having a change of shoes or clothing, nor anything to put on underneath to keep yourself warm or dry. Underwear, and what underwear? Hemingway's pauper would hardly have deigned to put it on. Was changed twice a month. Other clothes and shoes twice a year. It was all laid down with a crystalline clarity worthy of a Rakchev. Not in the first days of the camp, but later on they fitted out a permanent storeroom where clothes were kept until the day of release, and not handing in any article of wear among your personal belongings was considered a serious offence. It counted as preparation to escape and met the black hole and interrogation. Not to keep food in your locker. You queued in the evening to hand it in at the food store and in the morning to draw it out again, which effectively occupied those half hours in the morning and evening when you might have had time to think. Not to have anything in manuscript. Not to have ink, indelible pencils or coloured pencils. Not to have unused paper in excess of one school notebook. And finally, not to have books. In Spask, they took away books belonging to a prisoner on admission. In our camp, we were allowed to keep one or two at first, but one day a wise decree was issued: all books belonging to prisoners must be registered with the culture and education section, where the words "step lag, camp division number m"、mm, would be stamped on the title page. Henceforward, all unstamped books would be confiscated as illegal, while stamped books would be considered the property of the library, not that of their former owners. Let us further remind ourselves that in special camps, searches were more frequent and intensive than in corrective labor camps. Prisoners were carefully searched each day as they left for and returned from work. Huts were searched regularly, floors raised. Fire bars levered out of stoves, boards pried up in porches. Then there were prison-type personal searches, in which prisoners were stripped and probed, linings ripped away from clothes and soles from shoes. That after a while they started weeding out every last blade of grass in the camp area, in case somebody hides a weapon there. That free days were taken up by chores about the camp. If you remember all this, it may not surprise you to hear that making him wear numbers was not the most hurtful and effective way of damaging a prisoner's self-respect. When Ivan Denisovich said, "They weigh nothing, the numbers," it does not mean that he has lost all self-respect, as some haughty critics who never themselves wore numbers or went hungry have disapprovingly said. It is just common sense. The numbers were vexatious. Not because of their psychological or moral effects, as the bosses intended, but for a purely practical reason: that on pain of a spell in the hole, we had to waste our leisure hours sewing up hems that had come unstitched, getting the figures touched up by the artists, or searching for fresh rags to replace patches torn at work. The people for whom the numbers were indeed the most diabolical of the camp's devices were the devout women members of certain religious sects. There were some of these in the women's camp division near the Suslovo station, Kamishlag. About a third of the women there were imprisoned for their religion. Now it is plainly foretold in the Book of Revelations, chapter thirteen, verse sixteen, that it causes all to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. These women refused, therefore, to wear numbers, the mark of Satan, nor would they give signed receipts to Satan, of course. In return for regulation dress, the camp authorities, chief of administration General Grigoryev, head of separate camp site Major Bogush, showed laudable firmness. They gave orders that the women should be stripped to their shifts and have their shoes taken from them. The job went to wardresses who were members of the Komsomol, thus enlisting Winter's help in forcing these senseless fanatics to accept regulation dress and so on their numbers. But even with the temperature below freezing, the women walked about the camp in their shifts and barefoot, refusing to surrender their souls to Satan. Faced with this spirit, the spirit of reaction, needless to say, enlightened people like ourselves would never protest so strongly about such a thing. The administration capitulated and gave their clothing back to the sectarians, who put it on without numbers. Yelena Ivanovna Usova. 
wore hers for the whole ten years. Her outer garments and underwear rotted and fell to pieces on her body, but the accounts office could not authorize the issue of any government property without a receipt from her. Another annoying thing about the numbers was their size, which enabled the guards to read them from a long way off. They only ever saw us from a distance, at which they would have time to bring their guns to the ready and fire. They knew none of us, of course, by name, and since we were dressed identically, would have been unable to distinguish one from another, but for our numbers. But now, if the guards noticed anybody talking on the march, or changing ranks, or not keeping his hands behind his back, or picking something up from the ground, the guard commander only had to report it to the camp, and the culprit would expect the black hole. The guards were yet another force which could crush a prisoner like a sparrow caught in a pulping machine. These red tabs, regular soldiers, these little lads with tommy guns, were a dark, unreasoning force, knowing nothing of us, never accepting explanations. Nothing could get through from us to them, and from them to us came only angry shouts, the barking of dogs, the grating of breech blocks, bullets, and they, not we, were always right. In Ekebastuts, where they were adding gravel to a railroad bed, working without a boundary fence but cordoned by guards, a prisoner took a few steps inside the permitted area to get some bread from his coat, which he had thrown down, and one of the guards went for him and killed him. The guard, of course, was in the right. He would receive nothing but thanks. I'm sure he has no regrets to this day. Nor did we express our indignation. Needless to say, we wrote no letters about it, and if we had, our complaints would not have gone any further. On January the 19th, 1951, our column of 500 men had reached worksite ARM. On one side of us was the boundary fence with no soldiers between us and it. They were about to let us in through the gates. Suddenly, a prisoner called Malloy, Little, who was in fact a tall, broad-shouldered young man, broke ranks for no obvious reason, and absent-mindedly walked toward the guard commander. We got the impression that he was not himself, that he did not know what he was doing. He did not raise his hand, he made no threatening gesture, he simply walked on, lost in thought. The officer in charge, a nasty-looking, foppish little fellow, took fright and started hastily backing away from Malloy, shouting shrilly, and try as he would, unable to draw his pistol. A sergeant, Tommy Gunner, advanced briskly on Malloy, and when he was within a few paces gave him a short burst in the chest and the belly, slowly backing away in his turn. Malloy slowly advanced another two paces before he fell, and tufts of wadding sprang into sight in the back of his jacket, marking the path of the invisible bullets. Although Malloy was down and the rest of the column had not stirred, the guard commander was so terrified that he rapped out an order to the soldiers, and there was a rattle of tommy guns on all sides, raking the air just above our heads. A machine gun set up beforehand began chattering, and many voices vying with each other in hysterical shrillness screamed, Lie down! Lie down! Lie down! While the bullets came lower and lower to the level of the boundary wires. There were half a thousand of us, but we did not hurl ourselves on the men with the guns and trample on them. We prostrated ourselves and lay with our faces buried in the snow, in a humiliating and helpless position, lay like sheep for more than a quarter of an hour on that epiphany morning. They could easily have shot every last one of us without having to answer for it. Why? This was attempted mutiny. This was what we were like in the first and second years of the special camps. Pathetic, crushed slaves. But enough has been said about this period in Ivan Denisovich. How did it come about? Why did so many thousands of these misused creatures, the 58s, damn it all, they were political offenders, and now that they were separated, segregated, concentrated, surely they would behave like politicals. Why then did they behave so contemptibly, so submissively? These camps could not have begun differently. Both the oppressed and their oppressors had come from corrective labor camps, and both sides had decades of a master and slave tradition behind them. Their old way of life was transferred with them. They kept the old way of thinking alive and warm in each other's minds, because they travelled a hundred or so at a time from the same camp division. They brought with them to their new place 
a firm belief inculcated in all of them that men are rats, that man eats man, and that it can be no other way. Each of them brought with him a concern for his own fate alone, and a total indifference to the fate of others. He came prepared to give no quarter in the struggle for a foreman's job, or a trustee's cosy spot in a warm kitchen, in the bread-cutting room, in the stores, in the accounts office, or in the culture and education section. When a man is being moved to a new place all by himself, he can base his hopes of getting fixed up there only on luck and his own unscrupulousness. But when men are transported together over great distances in the same box car for two or three or four weeks, are kept stewing in the same transit prisons, are marched along in the same columns, they have plenty of time to put their heads together to judge which of them has a foreman's fist, which knows how to crawl to the bosses, to play dirty tricks, to feather his nest at the expense of the working prisoners. And a close-knit family of trustees naturally does not indulge in dreams of freedom, but joins forces to uphold the cause of slavery, clubs together to seize the key posts in the new camp, and keep out trustees from elsewhere. While the benighted workers, completely reconciled to their harsh and hopeless lot, get together to form good work teams and find themselves a decent foreman in the new place. All these people had forgotten beyond recall, not only that each of them was a man, that he carried the divine spark within him, that he was capable of higher things. They had forgotten, too, that they need not forever bend their backs, that freedom is as much man's right as air, that they were all so-called politicals, and that there were now no strangers in their midst. True, there were still a very few thieves among them. The authorities had despaired of deterring their favourites from frequent attempts to break out. Under Article 82 of the Criminal Code, the penalty was not more than two years, and the thieves had already collected decades and centuries of extra time, so why should they not run away if there was no one to dissuade them? And decided to pin charges under Article 58, Section 14, economic sabotage on would-be escapers. Altogether, not very many thieves went into special camps, just a handful in each transport. But in their code there were enough of them to bully and insult people, to act as hut wardens, and walk around with sticks, like the two Azerbaijanis in Spask who were subsequently hacked to death. And to help the trustees plant on these new islands of the archipelago the flag, shit-coloured, trimmed with black, of the foul and slavish, destructive labour camps. The camp at Ekibastutz had been set up a year before our arrival, in 1949, and everything had settled down in the old pattern, brought there in the minds of prisoners and masters. Every hut had a warden, a deputy warden, and senior prisoners, some of whom relied on their fists and others on tail-bearing to keep their subjects down. There was a separate hut for the trustees, where they took tea, reclining on their bunks, and amicably settled the fate of whole work sites and whole work teams. Thanks to the peculiar design of the Finnish huts, there were in each of them separate cabins occupied ex officio by one or two privileged prisoners. Worker signers rabbit punched you, foremen smacked you in the kisser, warders laid on with the lash. The cooks were a mean and surly lot. All storerooms were taken over by freedom-loving Caucasians. Work assignment duties were monopolized by a clique of scoundrels who were all supposed to be engineers. Stool pigeons carried their tails to the security section punctually and with impunity. The camp, which had started a year ago in tents, now had a stone jailhouse, which, however, was only half-built and so always badly overcrowded. Prisoners sentenced to the whole had to wait in line for a month or even two. Law and order had broken down, no doubt about it, queuing for the whole. I was sentenced to the whole, and my turn never came. True, the thieves, or bitches to be more precise, since they were not too grand to take posts in the camp, had lost a little of their shine in the course of the year. They felt themselves somehow cramped. They had no rising generation behind them, no reinforcements in sight. No one eagerly tiptoeing after them. Things somehow weren't working out for them. Hut warder Magaran, when the disciplinary officer introduced him to the lined-up prisoners, did his best to glower at them defiantly. But self-doubt soon took possession of him, and his star sank 
ingloriously. We, like every party of new arrivals, were put under pressure while we were still taking our bath on admission. The bathhouse attendants, barbers and store men were on edge and ganged up to attack anyone who tried to make the most diffident complaint about torn underwear or cold water or the heat sterilization procedure. They were just waiting for such complaints. Several of them at once flew at the offender like a pack of dogs yelling in unnaturally loud voices, You aren't in the Quibi Chef Transit Prison now! and shoving their ham-like fists under his nose. This was good psychology. A naked man is ten times more vulnerable than one in clothes, and if newly arrived prisoners are given a bit of a fright before they emerge from the inaugural bath, they will begin camp life with their wings clipped. That same Volodya Gershuni, the student who had imagined himself taking a good look around in the camp and deciding whom to join, was detailed on his very first day to strengthen the camp by digging a hole for one of the poles to which lights were strung. He was too weak to complete his stint. Orderly Baturin, one of the bitches who was beginning to sing smaller but still had a bit of bluster in him, called him a pirate and struck him in the face. Gershuni threw down his crowbar and walked right away from the hole. He went to the commandant's office and made a declaration. You can put me in the black hole if you like, but I won't go to work as long as your pirates hit people. The word pirate had particularly upset him because it was strange to him. His request was not refused, and he spent two consecutive spells in the black hole, eighteen days in all. This is how it's done. A prisoner is given five or ten days for a start, then when his time is up, instead of letting him out, they wait for him to start protesting and cursing, whereupon they can legitimately stick him with a second spell. After the black hole, they awarded him a further two months of disciplinary barracks, which meant that he stayed on in the jailhouse, but would go out to work at the lime kilns and get hot food and rations according to his output. Realizing that he was sinking deeper and deeper into the mire, Gershuni sought salvation through the medical section. He hadn't yet taken the measure of Madame Dubinskaya, who was in charge of it. He assumed that he could just present his flat feet for inspection and be excused from the long walk to and from the lime kilns. But they wouldn't even take him to the medical section. The Akebastut's disciplinary barracks had no use for the outpatient's clinic. Gershuni was determined to get there, and he had heard a lot about methods of protest. So one morning when the prisoners were being lined up for work, he stayed on the bed platform wearing only his underpants. Two warders, Polundra, a crack-brained ex-sailor, and Konensov dragged him off the bed platform by his feet and hauled him, just as he was, in his underpants to the line-up. As they dragged him, he clutched at stones lying on the ground, ready for the builders, and tried to hang on to them. By now he was willing to go to the lime kilns. Just let me get my trousers on, he yelled. But they dragged him along just the same. At the guardhouse, while four thousand men were kept waiting for their work assignments, this puny boy struggled as they tried to handcuff him, shouting, Gestapo! Fascists! Polundra and Konensov, however, forced his head to the ground, put the handcuffs on, and prodded him forward. For some reason it was not they who were embarrassed, nor the disciplinary officer, Lieutenant Machakovsky, but Gershuni himself. How could he walk through the whole settlement in his underpants? He refused to do it. A snub-nosed dog handler was standing nearby. Volodya remembered how he muttered, Stop making such a fuss. Fall in with the others. You could sit by the fire. You needn't work. And he held tightly onto his dog, which was struggling to break loose and get a Volodya's throat, because it could see that this lad was defying men with blue shoulder tabs. Volodya was removed from the work assignment area and taken back to the disciplinary barracks. The handcuffs cut more and more painfully into his wrists behind his back, and another warder, a Cossack, gripped him by the throat and winded him with his knee. Then they threw him on the floor. Somebody said in a business-like professional voice, Thrash him till he umps himself. And they started kicking him with their jackboots about the temples and elsewhere until he lost consciousness. The next day he was summoned to the chief security officer and they tried to pin a charge of terrorist intentions on him. When they were dragging him along, he had clutched at stones. Why? 
On another occasion, Tverdokleb tried refusing to report for work assignment. He also went on a hunger strike. He was not going to work for Satan. Treating his declarations with contempt, they forcibly dragged him out. This took place in an ordinary hut, so that he was able to reach the window panes and break them. The jangle of breaking glass could be heard by the whole line-up, a dismal accompaniment to the voices of worker signers and warders counting. To the droning monotony of our days, weeks, months, years. And there was no ray of hope in sight. Rays of hope were not budgeted for in the MVD plan when these camps were set up. Twenty-five of us newcomers, mostly Western Ukrainians, banded together in a work team and persuaded the worker signers to let us choose a foreman from our own number, Pavel Boronyuk, whom I have mentioned before. We made a well-behaved and hard-working team. The Western Ukrainians, farm workers only yesterday and not in collectives, needed no urging on. At times they had to be reined in. For some days we were regarded as general laborers, but then some of us turned out to be skilled bricklayers. Others started learning from them, and so we became a building brigade. Our bricklaying went well. The bosses noticed it, took us off the housing project, building homes for free personnel, and kept us in the camp area. They showed our foreman the pile of stones by the disciplinary barracks, the same stones which Gershuni had tried to hang on to, and promised uninterrupted deliveries from the quarry. They explained that the disciplinary barracks as we saw it was only half a disciplinary barracks, that the other half must now be built onto it, and that this would be done by our team. So, to our shame, we started building a prison for ourselves. It was a long, dry autumn, not a drop of rain fell throughout September and the first half of October. In the mornings it was calm, then the wind would rise, grow stronger by the middle of the day, and die away again toward evening. Sometimes this wind blew continuously, a thin, nagging wind which made him more painfully aware than ever of the heart-breaking flatness of the step, visible to us even from the scaffolding around the disciplinary barracks. Neither the settlement with the first factory buildings, nor the hamlet where the guards lived, still less the wire fences around the camp, could conceal from us the endlessness, the boundlessness, the perfect flatness, and the hopelessness of that step broken only by the first line of roughly barked telegraph poles running northeast to Pavlodar. Sometimes the wind freshened, and within an hour it would bring in cold weather from Siberia, forcing us to put on our padded jackets and whipping our faces unmercifully with the coarse sand and small stones which it swept along over the step. There's nothing for it. It will be simpler if I repeat the poem that I wrote at this time while I was helping to build the disciplinary barracks. The Mason Like him of whom the poet sings, A mason, I tame the wild stones to make a jail, No city jail. Here naught but fences, huts, and guard towers meets the eye, And in the limpid sky the watchful buzzard sail. None but the wind moves on the step, None to inquire for whom I raise these walls, why dogs, machine guns, wire are still not jail enough? Trowel in hand, I too work thoughtlessly until the wall is out of true. You'll be the first inside. The Major's easy jest adds naught to my fears. Informers have played their role. My record is pocked like a face marked by black pest. Neat brackets tie me to others bound for the hole. Breaking, trimming, hammer to merry hammer calls. Wall after gloomy wall springs up, walls within walls. While we mix mortar, we smoke and await with delight. Extra bread, extra slops in our basins tonight. Back on our perch, we peer into cells walled with stones. Black pits whose depths will muffle tortured comrades' groans. Our jailers, like us, have no link with the world of men but the endless road and the humming wires overhead. Oh, God, how lost we are, how impotent. Was ever slave more abject, hope more dead? Slaves. Not so much because, frightened by Major Maximenko's threats, we took care to lay the stones crisscross with an honest layer of mortar between them so that future prisoners would not easily be able to pull that wall down. 
but because even though we somewhat underfulfilled our norm, our team of prison builders was issued with supplementary rations, and instead of flinging them in the major's face, we ate them. Our comrade Volodya Gershuni was sitting at that very time in the completed wing of the disciplinary barracks, and Ivan Spassky, for no known offence, but because of some mysterious black mark on his record, was already in the punishment cells. And for many of us, the future held a spell in that same disciplinary barracks, in the very cells which we were building with such precision and efficiency. During working hours, when we were nimbly handling stones and mortar, shots suddenly rang out over the step. Shortly after, a prison van drove up to the guardhouse, where we were. It was assigned to the guard unit, a genuine prison van such as you see in towns, but they hadn't painted "Drink Soviet Champagne" on its sides for the benefit of the gophers. Four men were bundled out of the van, all of them battered and covered with blood. Two of them stumbled. One was pulled out. Only the first out, Ivan Vorobyov, walked proudly and angrily. They led the runaways past us, right under our feet, under the catwalks we stood on, and turned with them into the already completed right wing of the disciplinary barracks, while we went on laying our stones. Escape! What desperate courage it took, without civilian clothes, without food, with empty hands, to cross the fence under fire and run into the bare, waterless, endless open step. It wasn't a rational idea. It was an act of defiance, a proud means of suicide, a form of resistance of which only the strongest and boldest among us were capable. But we went on laying our stones and talking it over. This was the second escape attempt in a month. The first had also failed, but that had been rather a silly one. Vasily Bryukhin, named Blayuka, Muchanov, the engineer, and another former Polish officer, had dug a hole one cubic meter in capacity under the room in which they worked in the engineering shop, settled down in it with a stock of food, and covered themselves over. They naively expected that in the evening the guard would be taken off the working area as usual, and that they would then be able to climb out and leave. But when at knocking off time three men were missed with no breaks in the wire to account for it. Guards were left on duty round the clock for days. During this time, people walked about over their heads, and dogs were brought in. But the men in hiding held petrol-soaked wadding by a crack in the floor to throw the dogs off the scent. Three days and nights they sat there without talking or stirring, with their legs and arms contorted and entwined. Three of them in a space of one cubic meter, until at last they could stand it no longer. And came out. Other teams came back into the camp area and told us how Vorobyov's group had tried to escape. They had burst through the fences in a lorry. Another week, we were still laying stones. The layout of the second wing of the disciplinary barracks was now clearly discernible. Here would be the cosy little punishment cells. Here the solitary confinement cells. Here the box rooms. We had by now erected a huge quantity of stone in a little space, and they kept bringing more and more of it from the quarries. The stone cost nothing; labor in the quarries or on the site cost nothing. Only the cement was an expense to the state. The week went by, time enough for the four thousand of Erkibostos to reflect that trying to escape was insanity, that it led nowhere, and on another equally sunny day, shots rang out again on the step. An escape! It was like an epidemic. Again, the guard troops' van sped into the camp, bringing two of them. The third had been killed on the spot. These two, Butanov and another, a small, quite young man, were led past us, all bloody, to the completed wing, there to be beaten, stripped, tossed onto the bare floor, and left without food or drink. What are your feelings, slave, as you look upon them, mangled and proud? Surely not a mean satisfaction that it is not you who have been caught, not you who have been beaten up, not you who have been doomed. Get on with it! We've got to finish the left wing soon! Yells Maximenko, our pot-bellied major. And we lay our stones. We shall get extra kasha in the evening. Captain Second Class Burkovsky carries the mortar. 
Whatever is built, he thinks, is for the good of the motherland. In the evening, we were told that Batanov too had tried to break out in a lorry. It had been stopped by gunfire. Surely you have understood by now, you slaves, that running away is suicide, that no one will ever succeed in running farther than one kilometer, that your lot is to work and to die. Less than five days later, no shots were heard, but it was as though the sky were of metal and someone was banging on it with a huge iron bar when the news came. An escape! Another escape! And this time, a successful one. The escape on Sunday, September the 17th, was executed so neatly that the evening inspection went off without trouble. As far as the screws could see, the numbers tallied. It was only on the morning of the 18th that their sums wouldn't work out right, and work line-up was cancelled for a general recount. There were several inspections on the central tract, then inspections by huts, inspections by work teams, then a roll call from filing cards. The dogs couldn't count anything except the money in the till. They arrived at a different answer every time. They still didn't know how many had run away, who exactly, when, where to, and whether on foot or with a vehicle. By now it was Monday evening, but they gave us no dinner. The cooks, too, had been turned out onto the central track to help with the counting. But we didn't mind. We were only too happy. Every successful escape is a great joy to other prisoners. However brutally the guards behave afterward, however harsh discipline becomes, we don't mind a bit. We're only too happy. What do you think of that, you dogs? Some of us have escaped. We look our masters in the eye all the time, secretly thinking, let them not be caught, let them not be caught. What is more, they didn't lead us out to work, and Monday went by like a second day off. A good thing the lads hadn't legged it on Saturday. They'd taken care not to spoil our Sunday for us. But who were they? Who were they? On Monday evening the news went round. Georg Giteno and Kolya Stanok. We built the prison higher. We had already made the straight arches over the doors, built above the little window spaces, and we were now leaving sockets for the beams. Three days since they had escaped. Seven. Ten. Fifteen. Still no news. They had got away.